Hi, Peter. So welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Jessica Meyerson, and I am Community Advisor to the Software Preservation Network and Research Program Officer at Educopia Institute. This is the continuation of our seven-part series of webinars, exploring the fair use code and other legal tools for software preservation, co-hosted by the Association of Research Libraries and the Software Preservation Network. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, as always. Everyone but hosts and guests are asked to be muted throughout the webinar to maximize the audio and visual quality of the recording. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them directly into the chat box, your Zoom chat box, which you can find in your control panel to the bottom of your screen. I'll bring those questions up during the presentation, uh, during the Q&A section of the presentation, where we'll have time to field and discuss in, in a little more detail. Every episode in this series is being recorded. It will be transcribed and posted to the SPIN website, freely available for all. And today we are presenting episode five, Understanding the Anti-Circumvention Rules and Preservation Exemptions, a discussion with members of the Code of Best, Practice, Best Practices research team and our esteemed guests, including Jonathan Band from Policy Bandwidth, Jonathan Band is a copyright expert and counsel to the Library Copyright Alliance. In this role, among other work, he's participated in the Copyright Office's 1201 rulemaking process, including submitting requests for exemptions and testifying to the need for particular exemptions supported by the library community. We also have Kendra Albert with us today, clinical instructional fellow at the Cyber Law Clinic and lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. They fought for and successfully received exemptions for video game preservation with the Electronic Frontier Foundation in 2015 and for software preservation on behalf of the Software Preservation Network in 2018. Lindsay Jane Moulds is also with us today, software curator at Rhizome, a digital art nonprofit founded in 1996. Lindsay works to preserve software and restage legacy pieces of net art at Rhizome. She also manages the software collection and computer environments with a focus on browsers, and other web-related programs. And then finally today, your research leads and facilitators for this episode are Krista Cox, Director of the Public Policy uh, Initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries, and joined by Peter Yazzi, Professor Emeritus at American University Washington School of Law. Professor Yazi is one of the originators of the Fair Use Best Practices movement and is a co-author of the Software Preservation Code of Best Practices for Fair Use, along with Krista, Pat Ofter Heidi, who's also on the call today, and Brandon Butler, who's also joining us on the call. So in this fifth episode, Krista, Peter, Jonathan, Kendra, and Lindsay will discuss what the DMCA anti-circumvention provisions are and how they relate to copyright, fair use, and the code as well as how the triennial exemption rulemaking works and the exemption that's been obtained for software preservation. They will also discuss how to apply the exemption to your own practice. And with that, I'll hand it over to Krista. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, the DMCA and anti-circumvention provisions because in the course of interviewing um, all the practitioners that were gracious enough to share their expertise with us, they, wrote, uh, they raised concerns that even if they applied, technological protection measures could prevent them from doing their work. Um, and technological protection measures became an issue because in 1998, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act passed. And the DMCA, as it's known, uh, in was intended to implement the two WIPO copyright treaties, um, the, the, I'm sorry, the WIPO internet treaties, the WIPO um, copyright treaty and the WIPO performances and phonograms treaty. Uh, and I mean, it's widely known that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act went farther than what was required under the WIPO internet treaties, but nevertheless, it is part of our law and um, something that raises a lot of concerns for practitioners that are trying to blight to break technological protection measures, which are basically like digital locks around um, uh, things that are available digitally. So it could be a digital lock on a book, um, a digital book, or it could be something that is 
part of technology that's embedded, software that's embedded in our everyday um, technologies like Alexa and Google Home or uh, in uh, cars and that sort of thing today. Um, so these digital locks were intended to prevent piracy um, and the uh, kind of help cabin in any piracy that could occur on the internet, which could proliferate very quickly. But at the same time, I think that in 1998, we didn't realize how much um, technology would be embedded in these everyday things that we use and didn't know what kind of harms these provisions would have. And uh, these anti-circumvention provisions uh, have been interpreted, at least um, by some courts, to be a separate and independent cause of action. So it doesn't require any underlying copyright violation in order to violate Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act on anti-circumvention. While the uh, DMCA did provide a closed list of exceptions um, to those anti-circumvention pro uh, provisions, a lot of them today are seen as being kind of useless. So there is a exemption for libraries um, for purposes of acquisition. So you can break the digital lock in order to determine whether you need to acquire an item. Um, but practically speaking in the marketplace, that hasn't really been needed and it's not very useful for all the types of things that cultural heritage institutions want to do. Um, another example is uh, there's an exemption for security research, but people have criticized that because um, you know, it doesn't address another law that people are concerned about. So they said, well, even if we can we can circumvent it for purposes of the DMCA, we might be um, in violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the 12, Section 1201 has been criticized for being a little bit out of date. Fortunately, there is a provision in there um, that allows for a three-year rulemaking cycle. So every three years, the Copyright Office undergoes this rulemaking cycle in which people who want to use a, uh, a particular exemption to circumvent a TPM can go to the Copyright Office and ask for um, a new exemption. And in the past, there have been several rulemaking uh, processes so far, but in the past, it has been this very lengthy process that can take a year and a half or I think one year, the entire process from start to finish actually took two years, where the people who want an exemption go and ask for one. You put together this like dossier of information of why you need to do this um, and what the harms would be if you're not able to do it. Then the if someone wants to oppose it, a right holder wants to oppose it, they can say, well, we don't think it's, you know, this exemption is too broad. We don't think this exemption is necessary. Here are all the reasons why the Copyright Office shouldn't grant it. Um, there is also um, a hearing in which people can testify and say, no, we really need it, or right holders can say, no, you know, um, you know it's just this, this long process. Um, and people complained about it because it was very time consuming and uh, often the exemptions that were granted, uh, I would say particularly the, the later ones in like 2012 and 2015, were these very long, complicated exemptions uh, that a lot of practitioners um, and people in the field said, we, we need a lawyer to understand what these exemptions uh, even allow us to do. Uh, and so the Copyright Office did a study of 1201, um, and I think that in the last rulemaking cycle really did improve the process, um, allowed, allowed for a streamlined, um, a streamlined process for pe people petitioning to renew an exemption that already exists. The streamlined process only applied for uh, exemptions that existed, even if you wanted a related one that was treated as a new exemption. But I think overall, people were um, said that that process worked a lot better than the old process. And one thing that I want to mention about these exemptions uh, before I get any farther is to remind people that this isn't an exemption just to do something that you want to do. Um, it is an exemption where you have to show that it would be otherwise be a lawful use, most likely a fair use. And um, it's only because of 1201 uh, and these anti-circumvention provisions 
that you're not able to make these lawful uses like preservation, for example. Um, and there's a long list of exemptions that were granted in this last rulemaking cycle in 2018. It's you know things like jailbreaking your phone or making um, making uh, a read aloud version on an ebook uh, accessible for someone who's blind or print disabled. So now that we kind of have this high level overview about 1201 and the problems that anti-circumvention measures can have on otherwise lawful activities, I'd like to invite our guests to tell us a little bit more about their work and how it relates to overcoming these obstacles um, as it relates to both software preservation as well as other exemptions that cultural heritage um, organizations use. Uh, before I turn it over to John Band, who has worked on a number of exemptions for cultural heritage institutions, um, and Kendra Albert, who has worked on uh, the software preservation exemption, I'd like to, to ask my co-lead, Peter Yazi, or um, our other co-facilitators uh, co on the code, uh, Brandon and Pat, if they have anything to add on this kind of high-level overview. Hi, this is Peter. The The one thing I would add to that extremely um, excellent summary of a, of a difficult area is that I think that over time, the process, the, the, the exception rulemaking process that Krista has described, however, frustrating and however time-consuming and recently thanks to some rules changes it's gotten at least marginally less frustrating and less time-consuming but however frustrating and time-consuming it it has over the 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 years from the time of the DMCA onward proved to be on the whole worth taking part in the, the institutional response, which has been primarily and in the first instance from the Copyright Office, which conducts the inquiries and holds the hearings and issues the rules to which uh, Krista referred, has been, all things considered, a lot more positive and sympathetic than I would have predicted, did predict, 20 years ago. So it's not a perfect system. I think we would do, do well to be without it. And perhaps someday we actually will be able to, to shed it or to modify it substantially. But I think the record over, over a couple of decades shows that in the absence of anything better, it's a system worth trying to engage with and work within. Completely agree, Peter. Uh, so, since I'm not hearing anything from from Pat or Brandon, I say, I um, that was a great summary. That's terrific. Thank you. Uh, so, Jessica, I think we can turn it over now to Jonathan Band, who can talk about exemptions for cultural heritage uh, institutions and his work on this throughout the years. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Sure. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, uh, even though I, I do agree with uh, with uh, Peter that uh, participating in the rulemaking uh, makes sense, um, it is worth saying at the threshold or at the outset that the rules overall don't make any sense, meaning Section 1201 uh, and uh, uh, what it was trying to achieve um, at some sort of policy level, it doesn't make any sense to the extent that people on the line are trying to figure out, you know, well, well, gee, given that it's relatively easy to circumvent, um, what's the whole point of having this added layer? And you're exactly right. Um, as a practical matter, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And it, and it, and it does simply put in an additional sort of bureaucratic layer 
uh, that makes preservation activities and other kind of lawful activities more difficult um, and, and without and in any way diminishing infringement as a practical matter. But putting all that aside, uh, uh, let, let's just talk about you know, the world as, as it is as opposed to the world we want to live in. Uh, and um, uh, with respect to the, you know, I've been involved in, in, in these exemption, uh, exemptions since uh, the very beginning. Um, and uh, one of the early issues that the libraries uh, and other educational institutions were really worried about was uh, the circumvention of technological protections on DVDs. Um, uh, uh, as, as all of you know, uh, including film clips is, is sort of a critical piece of education now, certainly in, at college, but also in K-12. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're moving towards a world where um, you need to have media literacy and you need to know, uh, you know, the, the texts that we all read are not just books anymore, but, but films. And, and the ability to include films in classes was a very, is just a, there's just a, a pedagogic necessity to doing so. Uh, in the old days, it was relatively easy. You would be able to put together um, uh, a, uh, uh, you, you would splice together uh, uh, clips uh, from uh, a, a video clips. And so you'd be able to show sort of like a, a clip uh, of uh, you'd be able to have all these clips on on a on a on a on a tape, and you'd be able to go forward. And then you could even burn CDs. But once you started having Section 1201, um, and you'd have te you'd have technological protections on the uh, DVDs, and then the circumvention of the technological protections was unlawful. Then all of a sudden, it becomes difficult. Um, and so it was very very early on. It was obvious. Uh, it was evident that you needed to be able to circumvent the technological protection on the DVD, uh, which was called CSS Content Scrambling System, in order to uh, uh, put together a compilation of clips to use in a classroom. Uh, now, of course, very early, very quickly, uh, there was. Uh, uh, Technologies such as DSS, which allow you know DECSS, which allow you to circumvent the technological protection. So again, it was easy to to to, to break the the law, the digital lock. But again, you wanted people wanted to do it lawfully, especially if they were going to be teaching in a classroom. Um, and so uh, uh, the there were in these. I was involved in these early rulemakings, and what we had to do was sort of collect evidence uh, from educators of how they wanted to use uh, these exemptions, how they would, you know, the, the kinds of uses they would, they would make of these clips and why it was important. Um, and, uh, and we worked together with other people who had similar needs, uh, documentary filmmakers, um, and people who wanted to make other non-commercial uses, um, such as uh, 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 remix, people who were making remixes. Um, and, and so we all sort of worked together and, you know, we made, we submitted our own exemptions or our own, our own applications for exempt our own petitions, but we, we coordinated. Um, and, and, you know, we, early on, we were able to, to convince uh, um, the copyright office that this was a legitimate activity. Now, first they had to determine that the underlying use we wanted to make, such as showing the clips in a classroom or uh, a remix, we had to convince them that that was uh, a fair use or an otherwise legal use. Uh, and then we needed to convince them that there wouldn't be this adverse impact on the rights holders if we were granted an exemption and, and at the same time that we would be adversely affected if an exemption wasn't granted. Um, and and we were able to 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 get an exemption. Now, there was just two interesting dynamics that occurred. One was that uh, the, the the rights holders um, in every rulemaking would come up with all these arguments as to why the exemption shouldn't be renewed or why it needed to be narrowed. And over time, 
um, the, the exemptions sort of for educational uses sort of became simultaneously narrower and broader. So originally it was just for film classes, then it was for all college classes, then we were able to get, uh, you know, K-12, but again, originally with K-12, it was instructors. Then we were able to get students. So we were able to broaden the, 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 the kinds of people who could use the exemptions. At the same time, all sorts of other roadblock, the, the, the rights holders were able to claw back uh, various, uh, various aspects of these exemptions. And so there was this whole issue about quality, that you needed to be able to demonstrate that you needed to use the high quality uh, that 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 was only available uh, if you circumvent a technological protection, as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to using a screen capture, um, and and uh, uh, also they made it clear that you know you 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 um, ha had to use short clips, and so arguably. Uh, you could use longer clips under fair use or under Section 1101, uh, but but th there was this narrowing, um, and also just the the number of words in the exemptions kept on getting longer and longer, and so it was harder and harder uh, to, for someone to understand the exemptions. Um, but 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 now the, the way it's ended up is is uh, uh, having this. Um, the, the streamlined process that uh, Krista alluded to, where if you just want to renew the exemption, uh, uh, you don't have to sort of present all the new evidence, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, that has been enormously helpful. And also in this last rulemaking, the, the Copyright Office has tried to make the uh, exemptions themselves a little less verbose and a little easier to understand. Um, uh, but but they're, they're still far more complex than they need to be and far more difficult to, to understand. And, you know, they have far more caveats and limitations in them. I just briefly want to talk about two other, uh, you know, one other dynamic and then a couple of the other exemptions. The, 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 the dynamic that, it, that, that this, this process has sort of brought out is the, there's a, a very surreal quality to the uh, exemption, the rulemaking where the, the rights holders, you get the sense they feel that they need to oppose for the sake of opposing, um, and they end up making uh, sometimes really silly arguments. Uh, so the silliest was, um, we, we, again, we were arguing about why we needed to circumvent a technological protection measure, such as, again, such as so CSS on a DVD to, to be in, in order to assemble the clips. Uh, to show in a classroom. And, and the MPAA basically said, well, you don't need to circumvent a technological protection. You can just engage in camcording. You can just point your camcorder at a high definition screen and you can copy everything you need. Now, this is at the same time that they were running around, you know, running around the country, running around the world, getting all these camp anti-camcording laws passed. And but they did a demonstration to show how easy it was to camcord um, uh, really good images off of a high definition television. So again, it made like, you know, on the one hand they're saying it's illegal to do that. On the other hand, they're saying, no, you educators, you go ahead and do it. Uh, on the third hand, um, you know, they're, they're basically, if, they're, if what they were saying was true, that it is so easy to get good quality simply by pointing a camcorder or an HD, tele, uh, HD TV, then why are we going through this whole exercise at all? Meaning, why are they putting technological protections on if it is really the quality is just as good? Uh, and of course, we showed them that the, you know, we showed, convinced the corporate office that the quality wasn't as good. But again, there is this kind of bizarre dynamic where the, the uh, where the, uh, 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 where the, the laws of reason don't seem to apply within the uh, the twelve the context of the twelve hundred one rulemaking. Um, we were able to uh, let me now just touch briefly on some other areas where we that we worked on. Uh, we were able to get exemptions or with for for people with print disabilities uh, so that the read aloud functions could work. We were able to uh, work more recently on on exemptions uh, for uh, closed captioning so that you can circumvent the technological protections in order to insert the captions. Um, 
Uh, and that was something uh, where we were working with the, the, the disability services organizations. Um, and uh, and uh, then also uh, areas relating to software preservation. And this is where I pass the baton off to, uh, to Kendra. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I feel like uh, it, it's, um, it's kind of amazing to get like so much perspective on the on the 1201 process um, since the uh, since it's uh, it's beginning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically to prove Jonathan's point. Um, can you all see my slides? Not yet. Okay. Oop. There we go. Um, yeah. More specifically about exactly how complicated it does look in practice, uh, still even after the Copyright Office has sort of, I think, cut things back a little bit, um, by talking through the, uh, the, the current operating software pr uh, preservation exemption, which was SPN um, and ARL and the Library Copyright Alliance, um, sort of uh, a petition for last cycle. Um, and this, uh, the information I'm about to present is all also sort of available to you through the preservationist guide that um, SPN and the Cyber Law Clinic where I work um, released, which sort of walks through. And I won't claim that it's like uh, totally friendly for folks who are not lawyers, but as friendly as we could make it, um, walks through how this works. But I'm going to go through that in more detail, and then I'm happy to sort of answer questions. What you'll uh, what you'll see along the way is that it very much. Uh, response to what Jonathan was talking about, which is that um, there's a lot of sort of a little bit of intricacy here. Um, so first, the text of the actual exemption, which is long and complicated, you should not, in fact, try to read it. Um, that is why we have summarized it nicely in this guide, which is what I'm going to sort of base my walkthrough on. Um, but so the current operating software preservation exemption that was gotten through the uh, triennial rulemaking process has some threshold questions of availability. Um, and so in order to be eligible for the exemption in the first place, your institution must be a library, archive, or museum. Um, I know that that's not actually necessarily totally helpful to every institution because they may not like strongly fall into one of those buckets. I think generally speaking, if you feel like you are one, it may be a little bit of a know it when you see it kind of standard, um, but there's some more eligibility requirements in addition. So. Um, you have to be, make your uh, collections open to the public or routinely available to affiliate, unaffiliated outside researchers. Um, you must ensure that your collections are composed of lawfully acquired or licensed materials, um, implement reasonable digital security measures, have a public service mission, and train staff or volunteers that provide services normally provided by libraries, archives, or museums. So in order to even have the broader conversation about whether you can preserve software under the exemption, you have to meet all of these criteria. Um, and I think what's interesting about this is, uh, so the, I do think, as Jonathan mentioned, much of, I think, the Copyright Office's approach to the 1201 exemption process is trying to find ways to sort of do what they perceive will make everyone happy, which is sort of very narrowly fit the facts that have been placed before them by petitioners while not making exemptions that are broader because that might uh, frustrate or uh, uh, piss off the rights holders. Um, so something like this, where there's like a, bra a sort of specific set of eligibility criteria is pretty normal through this process. Um, and if you're an institution and you're like, or you work somewhere and you're like, hey, I would like to preserve stuff, but I actually don't fit really well within these criteria or these criteria are problematic for me. Um, this brings me to my sort of first overall takeaway uh, that is not the content of the exemption, which is you should come talk to to SPN, to LCA, to me, to Jonathan, to someone, um, because part of what drives these the crafting of these exemptions is the specific examples we can bring to bear about the kinds of preservation activities and the kinds of players who are trying to do particular preservation activities. And so when we think about, you know, when we're arguing in front of the Copyright Office saying, hey, you should renew this, but you should expand it slightly or eliminate these eligibility criteria, a lot of that is based on the examples that we can bring to bear that persuasively argue that the criteria are a problem. So if you see things that you think will inhibit your preservation of, of works, of software, um, we would love to know about them because that's something we can flag for the next round in three years. And in some ways, the good thing about the triennial rulemaking process is we always have the opportunity to go back and sort of try again. 
the next, so having said that, the next question in, that you want to ask when you're looking at the software preservation exemption is, is this software a video game? Um, so this, uh, on the face of things, makes no sense um, because uh, as I think actually Lindsay pointed out when she was kindly testifying in front of the copyright office, the difference between software and video game is not actually necessarily a nice clean line. Um, but if the software that you're trying to preserve is a video game that requires that connection to an external server for gameplay, um, a different set of rules apply to it than the one I'm about to walk through. And um, this is a, 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 mostly the Copyright Office's fault, but partially also mine, in the sense that uh, in the 2015 round, I worked with EFF to get an exemption for video games that required external server connections. So now there's two exemptions for software preservation, one that's specific to video games that uh, have, require an external server connection, and one that sort of covers all other software. It's laid out even more confusingly than that in the actual final rule uh, that the Copyright Office put out, but that's basically the gist. I'm going to talk about the, um, the exemption for software uh, for everything, all software that's not a video game that requires an external server for gameplay um, in this context. Um, so that's the first sort of, uh, that's another caveat, another thing to keep in mind. Then we ask whether the software is eligible. So there's a couple of criteria here, but frankly, this is like not super complicated. So the computer program must have been lawfully acquired, which means either like licensed or purchased. Um, I, I think inevitably, every time I've talked about this, have gotten a specific question about, hey, is this kind of specific thing lawfully acquired? But the answer is it's kind of hard to tell, um, sort of off the cuff. It's not a particularly well-defined term. So I think that, you know, if you have something specific that you're thinking about, talking to an attorney um, or, uh, you know, coming and talking to the cyber law clinic, would, we would be happy to help you figure it out. Um, the next sort of uh, criteria, and this is the big limiting factor on this exemption, is that the compute software must no longer be reasonably available on the commercial marketplace. And this was the major concession that we made during the course of the exemption process in order to get rights holders to be more comfortable with the sort of broad preservation exemption. Um, so what does it mean to be reasonably available in the commercial marketplace? Well, it can be specific to a particular version. So if Word is still being sold as Word 2018 or 2019. I don't know, at this point, they're probably running like four years ahead, so we're probably already in Word 2025 or something. Um, uh, that is if they're even actually marketing standalone software anymore and it's not just Office 365. But um, if you wanted to preserve a copy of Word 2003, just because Microsoft is selling later versions of Word, that doesn't mean that it's reasonably available on the commercial market. And the other thing is that um, the, um, the secondhand stores don't count, which is to say that you, even if you could potentially buy cop old copies of software on eBay, that does not necessarily make it reasonably available such that you can't preserve it. So, you know, the, the question here basically is, is the manufacturer or original distributor of the software still selling it? If not, then you can go ahead and preserve it under the exception. And then, as uh, Krista mentioned, there are some rules about the kinds of preservation activities you can undertake under the exemption. Um, so I think about this as preservation activity, eligibility. Um, the sole purpose of the circumvention activity must be for lawful preservation of the computer program or digital materials dependent on a computer program. So what that means is if you don't really care about preserving a certain version of AutoCAD, but you do need to preserve particular files that run off that version of AutoCAD, you can still preserve a version, that version of AutoCAD. Um, and this is an important thing to note because of the version dependencies of some, some um, software files. Um, the preservation can't be for direct or indirect commercial advantage pretty straightforward, um, or as straightforward as anything around here gets. Um, the preservation activity must be non-infringing. So if you've watched the very many uh, uh, previous uh, webinars in this series, um, you'll know maybe a little bit more about that, but it can be non-infringing because the software is not copyrighted. For example, if it was uh, software produced by the US government, um, because you have permission, uh, because section 108 applies, which is a library exemptions to the Copyright Act, or because we use this fair, see episode four. Um, so the, uh, those are all reasons um, that you can, that preservation activity may be eligible. There may be others as well, um, but those are the sort of, those are the big ones. Um, 
And that, if you've checked all those boxes, like congrats, go ahead and preserve the thing. Please don't worry about 1201 liability. Um, but one more caveat, you can't make copies of the computer program available outside. Um, the available is important and it's not on the slide, outside of the physical premises of the library, archive, or museum. So that's the exemption. Um, again, uh, if I've sped through it too fast and you're a little bit confused, uh, fair enough. Um, all of what I've just said is in the preservationist guide, which is on the SPM website. Um, I, th I sort of, before we go to over to Lindsay, want to just take it back to what Jonathan said and what Krista said about the sort of broader context of this process, which is that, um, you know, uh, 1201, I don't think folks were really thinking about the concerns of software preservationists when they were crafting, drafting 1201 as a response to the uh, US's copyright obligations. And so in some ways, like 1201 has never been a particularly good fit for the needs of, for the needs of lots of folks, but software preservationists specifically. Um, and so when we, we, and the Copyright Office, I think, understands that. I do think, frankly, um, e people associated with like uh, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, like GLAM, uh, cultural heritage institutions, tend to be the kinds of folks that the Copyright Office sort of thinks that the 1201 uh, um, exemption process is for. Um, but nonetheless, you see that you get these really complicated exemptions that can be hard to sort of navigate and fall into. And the best way we have um, until, you know, something like Congress amends the statute uh, to sort of get y'all who preserve work more latitude um, in this space is providing really good examples of what the kinds of harms that are coming about or the kinds of preservation pro projects that aren't possible because the exemption is narrow. So, um, that brings me to sort of what I, how you can help, um, which is that if this is something that affects your day-to-day -day work and you're interested in talking more and, or you use the exemption as part of your practice, um, we would love to hear about it. There's a, a use form, which I'll, I think we can send out in the sort of uh, background materials, or you can always just straight up email me um, and I'll make sure that the right folks within SPN or the right folks who are involved in sort of later exemptions find out about it. Um, because what we're interested in doing is making sure that, you know, we can use the facts on the ground to get as much latitude for software preservation as possible. Um, so uh, I think that's all for me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and you can always email me um, or follow up with me. Um, I, uh, although uh, I have not been doing uh, the 1201 process as long as Jonathan, um, I've done a 1201 across a variety of contexts, including for computer security researchers. Um, so it's a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm always happy to talk about it more. Thank you so much, Kendra. Huge thanks to Kendra um, and Jonathan. If you have questions for the two of them, I saw Melissa provided a question, which we've added to the queue. Um, please do continue to type them into the chat because we're keeping track of them in, a, in one list and we'll come back to them for the Q&A. So I'll hand it off to uh, Lindsay for now. Hi, um, Jessica, would you mind sharing my slides for me through the Educopia Institute Zoom, or how should I do this? Okay, awesome. Let me go ahead and exit full screen. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Lindsay Moulds, and I work at Rhizome. Um, I ha I participated by testifying in the 1201 um, exemption uh, hearings last year. But other than that, I am mostly a practitioner. So I'm going to just share some of my experiences working with archiving born digital materials. There are some ways in which the um, exemption totally applies to us and some of it, in some ways in which it doesn't, <laughs> which I'll get into a little bit. But mostly I just sort of wanted to give you an overview of what Rhizome does and why um, we sort of wrestle with like fair use and sort of also how a lot of discussion around fair use doesn't really quite describe exactly what we do. So um, I could have the next slide. I don't know what the best way to. Oh, shoot, I can start my video too. It's not going to be high quality, but I'll try. Okay, so um, Rhizome actually started as a community based mailing list, which was founded by an artist named Mark Tribe in 1996 and we've been pretty distributed but new york has been where we've been located since the beginning 
We're actually located on premises at the New Museum, which is a contemporary art museum in New York, and we're an affiliate of the New Museum. So we currently work out of New Inc., which is the New Museum's incubator and co-working space. So we have an artistic program that promotes born digital art projects and also organizes exhibitions. And we currently have an exhibition up in the new museum lobby called The Art Happens Here. But we don't actually usually have a physical gallery space. So generally speaking, our exhibitions are online. Um, yeah, can I? Yeah, great. Uh, in addition to online exhibitions and an editorial program, we've also had an online archive of born digital art called The Art Base online since 1999. And we also have a digital preservation program that builds in-house software tools to support preservation activities. So um, a lot of times we are working with sort of applying for grants or uh, working in spaces where we're working alongside other museums whose curation and archival practices are built for physical objects, which as we know are really difficult to extend to digital practices. So a lot of times we're working with things that are produced, distributed, or consumed via app interfaces or the web. And that's why Rhizome refers to these things as like born digital. So if you hear me saying born digital, that's kind of our terminology for um, things that were born on the internet <laughs> and for the internet. So this next slide is an example of that, which is um, Amalia Ullman's Excellences and Perfections, which was, um, it's a series of, Instagram posts and it actually consists, it's like an Instagram performance. So it, I think of this as like a time-based performance. Um, it's not just the pictures that make it, it's actually um, the fact that it was embedded in the Instagram platform and playing out over time. So to some degree when we say, I wanna preserve this piece of art, you're actually preserving parts of the Instagram platform and brand and layout as it existed in that moment. So we're not just documenting the work of artists specifically, but also the surrounding fabric of these websites and platforms. Um, thanks. Since the late 2000s, like Rhizome has moved away from simply just like accessioning all of the works into our archive to trying to continue to ensure public access to functional historical artworks. And we really want to develop new ways to archive and contextualize this artwork so that people can continue to appreciate it. And over the last three years in particular, we sort of shifted our focus to developing new preservation tools and strategies for reperformance. And a lot of institutions have put work into file preservation, file integrity, long-term storage in, like solutions for digital artifacts. There are probably a lot of people on this call who are, have expertise in that area. That's not really something we're like, interested in as an institution. We're not imaging hard drives. I'm not running file integrity checks every hour. What I really want to do is make it possible to access, access as many works as possible for as long as possible in a manner that's authentic to the intent of these works. So I want to support the performative qualities of artwork on the internet. I want people to be able to see, you know, what the artist intended when they made this work in 1999. And that's where things get <laughs> kind of difficult. So I'm gonna try and show you this video. Jessica, can you, okay. If that doesn't work, can you try advancing to the next one and see if you can play the one on that? Okay, that has, oh, can you play that one? Yay. So this is a video, it might be really tiny. Um, it's a piece called scroll bar comp composition. And it's basically like a big HTML page that has a bunch of um, sort of mini, Oh, is that the right? I think that's not the right video. I think I shared the wrong video. I'm sorry. Oh, that's format. Okay, that still kind of works. So <laughs> there are a lot of um, there are a lot of uh, pieces from this period in the web that use elements of the browser in a really specific way. So things like buttons, radio buttons, scroll bars actually constitute parts of the artwork um, formally. And so if you view these pieces in a modern browser, the scroll bars buttons, all of that stuff looks completely different. Um, so that's one of the kind, like that's an example of the kind of thing that we're actually trying to preserve when we like reperform this, um, is we really want this to be authentic to, um, you know, and I, I guess I say authentic to, but also it's not necessarily that there's one particular authentic browser for every single piece. You know, in 1999, there were certainly lots of different browsers that people could have been using to search the web. 
So I think um, part of it is like if uh, if something like scroll bar comp composition does look different in a bunch of legacy browsers that were contemporary, giving people the option to see it in those different browsers is really important to sort of understanding like what using the web was like at that point in time. And to that end, um, you can go ahead and advance because I'm not sure how long this video is. Um, a lot of what I do is trying to work with commercial software dependencies. And an interesting thing about working with internet art that was largely independently created in the 90s and 2000s is that you end up with all manner of software dependencies. Um, a lot of these dependencies are free, as in like freeware, but they are proprietary and they're really difficult to find now. Sometimes they were bundled with browsers. And before working at Rhizome, if you ask me about software dependencies, I'd say, oh, well, you know, maybe when I think of a software needing a specific dependency, I think, oh, it needs some specific version of Python, or I have to run it on Windows 7. But um, in actuality, it's more often in my case that I'm trying to dig up old versions of things like Real Player, things like um, Flash, Macromedia Director, like QuickTime. <coughs> Excuse me. So in some cases, um, it's, you know, I, I'm trying to find this browser plugin that was deprecated years and years ago and often without the artist's knowledge because sometimes these pieces haven't been revisited by the artists or anyone who created them in decades. And so there's been a great emphasis put on preserving software produced by artists and sometimes even the source code. But as far as proprietary plugins or middleware go, those have decayed and become inaccessible despite a lot of preservation efforts. So something can be in pristine condition otherwise maybe someone made really um really fantastic like backups of all of their work and um you know all of the executables they created for various platforms but if we can't actually get these dependencies from anywhere um it you know the work is not accessible and so that's where tpm becomes a point of difficulty for us is you know it's not as if you know, artists are bringing work to me like, oh, I put DRM on this tent. That's not like a thing so much as the middleware software, the supporting software, the dependencies have some kind of TPM or in most cases just sometimes require registration or something like that. And so we're really working to um, get all of these pieces together to create an environment that can support um, this artistic software. And so even if we totally have the rights, even if people, um, you know, were really diligent about saving their own work and preserving it, there are all of these other factors with web-based works, especially in the late 90s and early 2000s that are really sort of outside of, um, I guess, what people would think of as traditional, like, preservation in that regard. So um, some other challenges that Rhizome has are, um, you know, what kind of a memory institution is Rhizome from that checklist that Kendra shared? Like, what do we, like, where do we fit into that box? Some of them we take off, some of them we, like, are, it's kind of amorphous, like, when we apply for grants. Um, sometimes people say, oh, well, you're a library, not a museum. And sometimes people say, oh, you're a museum, not a library. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, we are located on the premises of a museum, but are we a museum? And um, yeah, so there's a, a little bit of a question of where we fit into the preservation landscape um, legally, but also like who are our peer institutions. And so that's something we're constantly sort of exploring as we preserve this work. And also um, just thinking about our mission as an institution of supporting born digital work, like what can we actually do to support artists when DIY software maintenance is out of reach for most private collectors. And this is something that was, <coughs> sorry, sort of brought up in the hearings last year, but hasn't really been addressed by the code as far as I'm concerned, is that, um, you know, it's kind of sad, but like we see a lot of artists who go back to producing physical ready-mades or ready-mades or like some kind of project that has a physical aspect they can sell because it's actually really difficult to sell um, digital-based works or born digital works to private collectors because there's not really a good path for people outside of memory institutions to maintain this artwork. 
So right now, if you're a private collector and you buy one of these pieces from someone, and then, you know, it depends on flash and then the flash breaks. This is a bad example because there's like, <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? If something um, goes wrong and you need the help of expertise and you would, you might need a 12 one exemption um, sort of leeway to be able to fix this piece and keep it running, what do you do? Do you bring it back to a memory institution? It's not, it's not clear to us. We don't know how to advise people. We don't know how to advise artists um, about how to build a sustainable practice when people are saying, I really want to buy your work, but I have preservation concerns. And that's something where we're trying to figure out like what a path forward would look like. And again, it's another thing where we're not sure, um, you know, there are other people who are trying to fix this uh, problem by, you know, oh, I want to attach like digital artworks to the Bitcoin. And that's how I'm going to, you know, that's how we're going to make pieces that are, can be sold to other people. But I think for for general purposes, it's like, to me, it's not necessarily that I, think it's problematic that the work can be replicated or that it's consisting of files. The problem to me is that we share these files and then we don't have any necessary, we don't have a way to care for them in the future. And we don't have a way to necessarily um, invite or show people how to care for them if they end up needing to use um, something like the 1201 exemptions in order to fix the dependencies. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, no, that's incredible. And I want to make sure because people definitely have questions for you, Kendra and Jonathan today. I just want to make sure that um, we get to those. So with that in mind, um, Melissa made a comment right there at the end, Lindsay, uh, that you might be able to speak to. And then, yeah, we will we'll get back to Another question that Melissa had, which is thoughts on practical options for limits to premises, which, as Kendra described, uh, is one of the limitations in the current software preservation exemption. Uh, Lindsay, would you like to speak, though, quickly to um, Melissa's comment on the fact that for acquisition practices for museums and museum boards, you know, they struggle with the fiduciary duty for funds where the work is temporary, so things that can't be owned. This is just building on your point, but is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that really, that summarizes kind of a larger issue in this kind of preservation, because I think, uh, Amalia Ullman's Excellences and uh, Excellences and Perfections is a really good example of this. Like, there have been showings of that that consist of books or prints on a wall. And I think I I can only speak for myself, but as someone who works at Ryzen and works a lot with digital materials, I think of that as being like a time-based artwork in the same way that. Um, you know, people who have like performance practices where you would go into a museum and see someone in a space doing some kind of like motion or movement or sustained performance to me it's more akin to that than it is to you know a series of photographs and i think that that's something that a lot of institutions struggle with i think it's something that there's not a lot of precedent for in terms of law and fair use and uh yeah i don't know what the answer is i think <laughs> um, trying to sort of I don't know like yeah it's it's kind of like the video game problem it's like will creating more definitions around these things actually help or hurt and it's it's difficult it's definitely difficult that's a that's a great response thank you so much Lindsay and with that we'll we'll go back to one of our first questions um, Melissa this is also from you so feel free to elaborate on this but just thoughts on practical options for the limit to premises, um, which is in the current software preservation exemption. Kendra, would you like to take that one on first? Sure. So, um, uh, in my attempt to make things slightly more simple, I, I didn't include one of the words that is in the actual exemption, which is physical premises, um, which clarifies somewhat uh, in a maybe not ideal way. <laughs> um, 
that the uh, software has to be kept on the physical premise, uh, not made available outside the physical premises of the library archive or museum. Um, you know, I think we don't know much about what that means other than that. Um, you know, uh, and I'd be happy if there's particular scenarios they're thinking about, I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, you know, I do think that uh, that's a real challenge and I think a real problem for software that's primarily depend that software that people are preserving primarily for exactly the kind of stuff Lindsay was talking about, which is the fact that it, it's a dependency for other works because, you know, if the goal is to use software to circumvent TPMs in order to enable software to be used to access works more broadly, um, you know, there might be really valuable options in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, sharing it with other, other institutions. But yeah, the language in the exemption is physical premises. Hi, this is, this is Peter. And if I could just jump in for a moment, <clears throat> I had one thought about this question. Is it okay if I? Absolutely, repeat? please. So earlier on in, 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 your, in your, your excellent presentation, Kendra and, and Krista as well, you were talking about some of the, some of the terms that remain undefined or at least softly defined in the exemptions generally, and of course in this good new exemption in particular. We're told things should be short, but we aren't told how short short is. And now we're told things should be on premises, but we aren't told exactly what premises are. My sense, and I think this is true of the lived experience of all kinds of beneficiaries of different exemptions over years, is that the system, for good or ill, and I obviously think it's more for good than for ill, depends a great deal on the, the good faith activities of the beneficiaries of the exemptions to make reasonable judgments about these definitional questions, and then should, and it almost certainly would never come to that, but should in the extremely unlikely event those judgments be challenged, then to be prepared to explain them. With respect to premises, we, we've talked a lot in the previous episodes of the webinar about the way in which the code of best practices recognizes and encourages certain kinds of networked activities, both those that originate in the physical premises of particular institutions and engage their constituents, their students, their faculty, their researchers, wherever they are to be found. And we also have talked about the somewhat more ambitious model in which physical institutions may join together to create consortia through which in turn all of their members and constituents will have access to a broader range of materials. And I would like to urge those who are going to be thinking both about how to behave under the new exemption and about how to implement the code of best practices to think relatively broadly rather than narrowly about this question of premises. It's pretty clear what the limitation that is was written into the statute is getting at. It's getting at discrete freestanding copies of software that can, may find their way out of the institution into the wild, so to speak, and then potentially be put to a wide variety of uses, at least some of which may be less, less easily defended than the, inst the uses that have institutional connections. But I must say that I would be and, and would, be, would be interested in, in encur I would encourage the community to think about the possibility that uses on the premises not, does not any longer necessarily refer to uses which are wholly and entirely confined within a bricks and mortar space that uses on the premises can also be thought of 
consistent with what I understand the intention of the limitation to be, to involve network uses originating from and under the control of a located institution. I can't tell you for sure that that's the right definition, but I don't think anyone can tell me for sure that it's the wrong definition either. And it's certainly a definition that could be embraced by a community in good faith. Thank you, Peter. That's wonderful and hopefully empowering to everyone on the call. Um, and I just want to follow up to that. I know we're out of time. We're at the top of the hour. I'm going to ask a quick question for the purposes of this recording. And I'm going to hand this over to um, Kendra and Jonathan. Uh, and if some of you have to leave, we completely understand. But again, this is for the purposes of the recording. I think it's an important question. So given the current limitation of the software preservation exemption, as just described by Kendra and Peter, um, could you tell us a little bit about what a recommended expansion for the next round might look like and what the community needs to do, produce, or document to help support the expansion of uh, a future um, round of triennial rulemaking? Well, uh, let me just jump in and then, because Kendra actually knows a lot more about the subject than I do. Uh, so if I let her go first, I won't have anything to say. Um, I, I think the, the, the most important thing, uh, and this is really underscores what Kendra said, is uh, in terms of what people can do, is as they're going through their their day-to-day -day work in this area, Whenever there's an area or something, a problem that you have, write it down, make a note. And, and then uh, when, when the time comes, uh, when Kendra and others are working on the new exemption, having those examples of the shortcomings or the problems or the complications, it will, will be very helpful. I mean, because then we can you know, be very concrete and say, you know, so-and-so was trying to do X, Y, and Z with this specific program and couldn't, or had this difficulty. And, and nothing, it's in this area, nothing works like uh, the anecdote um, and, and the concrete. And so that, that's what everyone on the phone can do. Um, but, but I'll turn it over to Kendra in terms of you know, certain areas where that are that are pretty obvious that need to be fixed. Yeah, no, I that's uh, Jonathan's totally correct, which is like the most useful thing is evidence and anecdata uh, might be the slightly slightly expanded version of anecdotes. Um, I think there are two areas that I think we're currently thinking about targeting. Um, and this is something I haven't necessarily discussed fully with all the stakeholders. So this is sort of my personal view on it. One is uh, broadening the, the, the eligibility criteria at the beginning um, to be beyond library archives and museums to any institution, any cultural heritage institution that meets the 108 categories or the, the categories that I mentioned, um, partially to deal with exactly the problem Lindsay flagged, which is that uh, if it's not really clear exactly what your institution does, but you do all of the things that uh, uh, the Copyright Office wants, the name of your institution shouldn't pose a problem or create uncertainty. And the other thing is, uh, as we've already talked about, probably broadening the premises uh, language to more specifically reflect the kinds of the understanding that Peter was emphasizing, which is sort of a control, either you know something like a maybe a controlled lending model or a sort of... Um, a access over uh, over on network or access to copies that are controlled um, and including that so that software can be more widely used um, without uh, understanding that that does not create significantly more risk of piracy um, than before. So I think those are the two areas that I currently sort of have on my list to target. But of course, you know, if, the, if there are other things that the community keeps running into in terms of problems with the exemption, you know, we're happy to sort of take up the, take up the banner and figure out where we, can, where we can make changes. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Kendra. I just want to say huge thanks to all of our esteemed guests today. Jonathan, Kendra, Lindsay, um, that was a very engaging uh, set of presentations and hopefully everyone walks away from today's webinar with a with a, a better understanding of the relationship between the exemption and the code 
Um, we so appreciate you all showing up and being here for the discussion today. And we say, you know, join us next week, same time, same place. We've got episode six, making the code part of software preservation culture. So again, this question of community engagement and ownership um, is really paramount to the topic of, of next week's episode. And that will be featuring Gordon Quinn um, from um, Cardam Quinn Films and Lindsay uh, Wiramuni from Open Courseware at MIT. And next week's episode will be facilitated by uh, Pat Ofterheide of American University and Peter Yazzie of the Washington School of Law at American University. So thanks again for joining us today. We hope to see all of you next time. Have a lovely day.